Here I am, part two. Now, we were talking about Mr. Lowell, right? So, in Massachusetts, they were so inspired with this new factory that was there. They would name the town after Francis Cabot Lowell. Lowell, Massachusetts. Yes, they did. And we, we just got done talking about labor unions, didn't we? Just a little while ago. So let me tell you some of the problems that they had. Why they had to form these labor unions. Women and children made up an awful large part of these here factories. Women and children. Because they could be paid less. <laughs> There's a reason. They could be paid less. Now, I'm going to tell you some things that you might not like, but this way it's going to be. Because wages were low, entire families sometimes had to go to work in the factory. Mamas, daddies, kids, everybody. Now, you're saying, well, kids 13, 14. I'm talking anywhere from 6, 8, to 9 years old. Yes, they did. I want you to look a few things up. Factory workers put in long hours, 12, 14 hours a day, six days a week. Six, not seven, six days a week. Very unsafe conditions, folks. Very unsafe conditions. Bad lighting, can't see. They didn't have electricity. They had to use candles. That's a problem. Poor ventilations. Harm the workers' respiratory health. Couldn't breathe. Fibers going inside their nose, inside their mouth when they breathe. Like I said before, they needed a mask. Typical American industries. But it needed to be fixed. So they figured this. A machine can always be fixed and be replaced. Skilled craftsmen. Not as much. But as you start getting older, they figured, when my own machines get old, I replace them. Same with my workforce. When they get old, we replace them. You were just a number, folks. You were just a number. We hope that Francis Cabot Lowell wasn't like that. Workers had tended to machines. They performed some of the tasks over and over and over again. So they created these labor unions, skilled artisans like carpenters, shoemakers, printers. They formed a labor union and it would become a big thing. It is today, still. 90% of the people still lived on farms by 1810. 90%. This was a farming area here. Yes, it was. 1810, 90% of all people still lived on farms. Now they're starting to move to cities. Just a little bit. New York City was ranked as number one as the largest city in 1810. So let me tell you, give me some numbers. Population doubled from about 96,000 people to 203,000 from 1810 to 1830, just in 20 years. 20 years. Philadelphia was big too. Remember Philadelphia? It was the capital for a while until Washington, D.C. It went from 91,000 to 161,000 in the same 20 years. So that 20 years was big. They were building all kinds of new buildings because people wanted more. And these little towns had started to become bigger cities like we see them today. New York City, Philadelphia's a big city, Boston's a big city. Maybe the place that you're at's a big city. All because of this. But they had troubles there. Exactly what Thomas Jefferson talked about. There was no clean water. No, there was no clean water. There was no indoor plumbing. 
you had to take it out back. There was no fire protection. Remember I told you they were just wooden structures that could catch on fire like that and then catch your next house on fire and catch the next house on fire. And the public health was bad. We're going through something right now called a pandemic. A pandemic where you could catch something. They had it back then too. Yes, they did. They had something. They eventually would have plagues and they were caused by all kinds of different viruses and fleas they said it was caused by rats but really it was the fleas that was on the rats that would cause things now why would you have rats anyway because they threw the food the scraps right out in front of the house now, they didn't live in just houses like we have they had board houses or they had apartment type houses Everybody lived too close together. You need that fresh air, like old Zeke has right here. Breathe that in. It smells good, okay? So, let me tell you about these young children that worked in the factories. Most often time, they were barefoot. Now, why is that? Well, because they had to be climbing up on these machines to get them fixed. If a belt fell off or something got clogged or they needed oiled up, they send them kids up there because some of us adults are too big to crawl up there. These little kids, without any shoes on, they use them feet like their claws, and before you know it, they're scampering right up on top of that machine. They would sweep the floors, they'd do whatever they had to do around the place. And what if they got hurt? What if they got their arm caught in something and broke it? Or even worse, lost it? Workman's comp, right? No. No workman's comp. Insurance? There's no insurance. No, folks. They were expected to come back the next day or they was fired out the door. There was plenty of kids to take their place. Plenty of kids. They were expendable. We call that today child labor. And there are child labor laws that you have to start to follow. Back then they didn't have it. Back then they did. There was a young lady named Elizabeth Ann Seton. And what she did was she was founder of a parochial school to get these children in school so were you going to school when you were working in the factory no no you weren't she put efforts into opening up these schools and getting these kids involved in school now it wasn't helping the family any because they weren't making any money maybe they could do something after school but she also started to put some things in play here what it was Somebody has got to speak up for these kids. And they did. They did speak up for these kids. Now, I want to tell you about somebody else. You're going to like this story. There was a man named Eli Whitney. Can you write this down? Eli, Eli, Whitney. Eli Whitney, in 1797, he was an inventor now. He was an inventor. He invented all kinds of things. Okay? Eli Whitney, when Congress would vote to prepare the nation in 1797 for war with France, remember that? Including the appropriation of a large amount of funds for new weapons. This is when who was president? John Adams. Remember, he wanted to stay out of war with France, and already Congress, they had war hawks, they wanted to go to war with France. So the young inventor, Eli Whitney, already known for some other inventions that he had that we're going to talk about, seized the opportunity to make a fortune. Yes, he did. In mid-1798, he obtained a government contract to manufacture 10,000 muskets 
10,000. We weren't buying them from nobody. We were making them ourselves. With an extraordinary short time frame of less than two years, he was going to make 10,000 muskets. Did he have a factory? No. Was he going to do it himself? Well, I'm sure he had to have some help. By January of 1801, January 1801, he failed to produce one single promised weapon. Didn't, didn't make one. What was he doing? Well, he was called to Washington to explain. Justify using treasury funds before a group of people, including the outgoing president, John Adams. John Adams just about ready to leave and Jefferson was coming in and war had been averted. Remember? War had been averted. What happened to all that money, Mr. Whitney? Well, as the story goes, Whitney put on a display for the group of people there, assembling muskets before their very eyes, choosing, seemingly, from a group of parts that was sitting on a table. Here's what he did. He had buckets of parts, and he took one of them muskets, and he took the whole mechanism out, he set it on the table. Now he took a part from this basket, a part from this basket, a part from this basket, started assembling it together, put it in that gun, and the congressman, including the outgoing president, Mr. Adams, said that's never going to work. Click, it worked. Now he even did this. He even took the other one that he took out, took pieces off it, took pieces from this basket, put it on that. And they said, now we know that's never going to work. Guess what? It worked. It was something called interchangeable parts. Can you say that? Interchangeable parts. Didn't they have that before? No. Every gun was made on its own. You couldn't take part of one gun and put it on another gun and make sure it was going to work. It wasn't working that way, folks. It was amazing. Mr. Adams said, can I try that? Can I try to make one of those? Well, sure. Mr. President, go ahead. He made his own, put it in that gun, and it worked. So that's what you've been doing for two years. Yes, sir. That's what I've been doing. Can you make us some weapons? They did. This way, a soldier that's in the field, if his gun breaks, he can reach in his pouch, or he can go back to the wagon, and they can fix that there gun, and make it work again instead of having it become just a big club. Because once the hammer breaks, once the trigger breaks, once a part spring breaks on that gun, it just becomes a club, folks. You can't use it no more. Now you can. And so soldiers started carrying toolkits and extra parts they know would break. Interchangeable parts. So today, when you have some kind of machine at home, you can find a part that will fit it so the old part is thrown away. Yeah. This is where it starts right here. Eli Whitney using his old noggin up here. He's smart. Interchangeable parts. You don't just take something and throw it out to the curb. You fix it. You make it work again. You fix it all up. That's what you're supposed to do. And guess what you save? A lot of money. A lot of money. Yeah, you save a lot of money. That's what old Zeke does. I fix things. I make it work all over again. Now, Eli Whitney's parts, the first use that he tried it on his own was 1798. He didn't bring it to them till almost 1801. Before this time, every gun I said was made differently. Dividing up his labor force to make these weapons would be in simple jobs. 
not creating the whole thing at one time. This group of men or women would assemble this certain parts together. Then it would move down the line. Somebody else would assemble a few more parts and move down the line. Somebody assemble a few more parts or move it to another building. Somebody assemble a few more parts. Listen to what they call that. The division of labor. Division of labor. Soon all factories were using it. And later on in history, there would be a man named Henry Ford. Henry Ford. Guess what he created? No, he didn't invent the car. He didn't invent the car. The car had already been invented. But he improved on it. And he improved on the way that they were making them too. He created a car on an assembly line. Just exactly the way Eli Whitney had pictured it so many years before. Parts of the car come down the assembly line. People are assembling things all together. And it's just like that cotton mill we talked about. Everything comes in raw material. And guess what comes out the other end? A brand new car. A brand new car. That's a perfect example of American ingenuity. We can do anything we put our minds to. And you can do anything that you put your mind to. All you got to do is believe in yourself. Hey, I believe in you. And I'm all right here. I believe in you already. Division of labor. You remember that. It was used in all types of factories. So I'm going to give you a couple other men and women's names that I want you to remember. First of all, there was a man named Robert Fulton. Can you say that? Robert Fulton. He designed a steam engine for a steamboat that can move against the current instead of going with the current. What's a current? Current is when the water just moves one way because of being forced that way. Well, it's okay if you're going downstream, but what if you want to go back up? Well, he put a steam engine on a boat to make it go back up. Steamboat created more opportunities for trade and transportation. If you could go all the way down and come all the way back on the same river without having to go all the way around the block. It was a great invention. James Watt, James Watt, would improve on that design of the steam engine, make it a little faster, make it a little bit more efficient. And then Oliver Evans built the first high-powered steam engine in 1802. 1802, folks. So 1802, we had steam engines going up and down the rivers. If y'all remember, there was a boat that Robert Fulton had called the Clearmont. The big news. And the Clearmont broke records of taking a ship and going upstream using steam powered only. Inventions. Guys and girls are thinking out there. They're thinking about things. The other person I want you to know is a man named Samuel Morris. Samuel Morris. Dot, dot, dat, dash. Dot, dot, dash, dash. Does it ring a bell? He invented the Morse code. Morse code. Well, what do you use Morse code on? You use it on a telegraph. A telegraph. And a telegraph was invented by Samuel Morris. Telegraph service. It sent long short long and short pulses of electricity along a wire long and short pulses of electricity along the wire with breaks in between with the telegraph it took seconds to communicate with another city seconds we got something today called a telephone a telephone same premise same premise, but Samuel Morris started off with this. Now, as they start stretching these wires across the USFA, more and more people would be connected by a telegraph office. So if you worked in a telegraph office, you listened to the dot, dot, dash, dash, called the Morse code. 
and you would write down messages and you go deliver the message to whoever it was. Now, you were in a big city. You might have to go find that person. But for the most part, if you were in a small town, everybody knew who you were. And they let you know, hey, you got a telegraph for you. Or I'd have to d deliver a telegraph or give it to a boy and go deliver it. Creating jobs. Creating jobs, yes. The invention of the telegraph is going to bring people a lot closer. A lot closer, just like the steamboat. But this way, seconds. You can get a telegraph to somebody. They could be telegraphing you back. There was a young man that worked at a telegraph office one time. He didn't do a very good job. He could not get the telegraph right. And once he did, he didn't deliver some of them. One day the boss came in and said, Son, I'm going to have to let you go because you're doing such a bad job in this telegraph office didn't stop this young man from being great. You know who he was? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln got fired from the telegraph office. <laughs> I guess he never was a very good communicator, but that's another story, okay? Now I'm going to give you a name that I know you're going to know. And this man's name is John Deere. John Deere. Nothing runs like a deer. No, he wasn't a track star. He wasn't a track star. John Deere in 1836 invented a lightweight plow with a steel cutting edge. Steel cutting edge, not iron. Steel. That's hard pressed. And as it would cut through the dirt, it made nice furrows. And then you put a couple of them together and you could plow a lot at one time. Now Deere's plows made preparing the ground so much less work for these farmers. It became very, very popular. Eventually, you know, he went on to make even better than just plows. He made tractors. With that combustible engine that would come out, he would make tractors. And just today, when you see that name, John Deere, he's a man of greatness. Yes, he is. He's a man of greatness. He's got a good head for business. Always thinking, staying up with the times. He didn't just still make plows. He made tractors now. Everybody that's out on the farm knows John Deere. Another man's name is Cyrus McCormick. Cyrus McCormick. Now you might know that name McCormick from all the spices that are out there or the spices that are in your mom's cupboard. You go in your mom's cupboard and take out a spice, see if it doesn't say McCormick. Yes, it's the same family right there. Same family. But Cyrus made something else. He invented a mechanical reaper. Now, when you say reaper, what are you talking about? I'm talking about something that cuts down grass. <sighs> Just like that. Cuts down the wheat. Cuts down the old stuff that you don't want in your field no more. But he made one that was a mechanical one that you wouldn't have to use so much of this. Making life easier for us. That's what he did. He would cut grain from the field just like that. You know what that means? You can plant more grain. You can plant more grain because you can get it done faster. That's one reason why they didn't plant as much because they had to do everything by hand. But if you can do it by machine, it makes things a lot easier and you can make more of it. You understand? You can make more of it. Just think with the car. Back in the day when it was just horses and wagons, they only traveled a short distance in a day. Now, we can travel a long distance in a day. Instead of just maybe 10, 15 miles with a wagon or a horse, we can go 500 miles things a lot easier. Now, there was also a machine called a threshing machine. A threshing machine would separate the, the kernels of wheat from the husks that they grew on, which was a faster way of getting wheat 
and picking it by hand. The threshing machine, it just sounds ominous, doesn't it? The threshing machine, it sounds like something that could really hurt you. Well, it can if you get yourself involved in it. The wrong end of it, that's it. But it increased the growing of wheat to where the farmers now, especially in the Midwest, and I'm talking about the Ohio Territory, was growing so much wheat that they were providing a lot of food for people that didn't have it. Today, today, in this here time period today, the United States of America provides food to feed a lot of people in other countries. We do a lot of good things here. We produce a lot of food to feed other people that can't help to feed themselves. You're living in a good country here, folks. Yes, you are. You're living in one of the best countries around. And we help people besides our own people. And the reason we can do it, machines, big big machines. They do a lot of work that we would have to usually do by hand. I'm not afraid to do it by hand. You know, old Zeke, look at that there now. I'm not afraid to do it by hand. But it just takes so much longer. I'd rather be up in that machine and have it help me work a little bit. Wow. Now, there was one time, and I'll tell you one story, about somebody from way back named King David. Did you ever hear King David? King David was on his way to a battle. Had a lot of men. Lots of men. And these men were hungry. And they came through a wheat field. And the wheat was growing pretty tall. As the men came through, they just grabbed the wheat with their hands. And they started to rub it in between their hands and eat the kernels. They were just eating it raw farmer came out you imagine all these men walking through there farmer came out and said what are you doing you're ruining my whole crop well i'm not going to be able to make any money then he realized it was king david's army oh <gasps> i'm sorry king david said this we're on our way to a battle your wheat is strengthening my men it will help them to win this battle if we win i'll give you five times which you have. They won the battle. Yes, they did. But you can imagine how many hands going through that wheat gathered everything, just like the machines do today. Same thing, just like the machines do today. Now, I'm getting to the end here. Stay with me. New technologies. New technologies. With new farm equipment, the Midwestern farmers in the Valley of Ohio grew a lot of feed and a lot of food for not only men and women and their families, but horses and cattle. And most of all, a lot of them fa factory workers, they didn't have no farms to go to anymore. Remember, they was living in the cities. And now... The farmers are bringing food into the cities. Hey, it ain't for free. It ain't for free, okay? Somebody's going to be paying for it. So they had farm markets. They called them farm markets. These people that were living in the city, they realized what it was. They had been on a farm before. They grew up on farms. Now they got to pay for the food. So the Midwestern farmers, there's an important fact here, became the market of Northeastern manufacturing workers. Let me say that again. Midwestern farmers became a market for Northeastern factory workers. There you go. And the factory workers started producing enough things for the Midwestern farmers. Goes both ways, don't it? As they were providing food, the Northeastern manufacturing workers were providing cloth and products and goods that would make life easier for the farmers. 
it's a big circle. It's a big circle. It's a good circle. It really is. The economy in this country was going up. The economy was going up. People were making money. People were being happy. Isn't that the American dream? That's what old Zeke wants. I want the American dream. I have it right here. I'm talking to you. The growth of the textile factories increased now the demand for the product, and that was cotton. It was southern cotton. Southern cotton. They needed more fields. They need to plant more cotton, and they would. But it also led to something else. The expansion of slavery. The expansion of slavery. If you got more fields and you're planting more cotton, you need more slaves to pick it. Well, why do you need slaves? It's just the way it was. You needed workers. And they figured the best way to keep their workers there was to have them enslaved. It's not the right way. We all know that. But this was in the 1800s, folks. This is in the 1800s. You got to think of what times it was. So Eli Whitney had invented something before the interchangeable parts that would become very, very important to the farmers. It was called a cotton gin. The gin stands for engine, but it really didn't run by gasoline or oil. It ran by a crank. Let me explain what this did. It was like a big wooden box and it came in various sizes. And as you cranked this box, put the raw cotton in and what the cotton has in it is little seeds. Okay. Normally, as the people pick the cotton, they take it over to the seed pickers for a better word. And the seed pickers would sit there all day, pick the seeds out of the cotton, put the seeds in a barrel, and put the cotton over in this pile. The cotton gin took the seeds right out of the cotton, separated the seeds from the cotton. Pretty good invention. It took the place of 50 workers on a farm. 50! 50, 50 workers! So why does that expand slavery? Why can't you just use that cotton? Let's think about it. Let's think about economics. If you have 50 people now that aren't picking seeds out of cotton, what can you do with them? Well, you can put them out in the field, make things a lot faster. You could, but that's not making you no more money. You buy more land, you put them on that land, and you go buy more slaves and another cotton gin. Now you've got two, two lands working for you. A lot more people to feed, though. Did they think about it? A lot more people to take care of. They were making so much money. There was such a demand for cotton that slavery doubled overnight. It doubled overnight. So there's a machine that Mr. Whitney thought would be a blessing for the country. And it was, but it was also a curse because they doubled the size of the slavery to pick that cotton. See, a lot of people are very good at economics and they're greedy. They want the money. So to get the money, they got to do some things that aren't too ethical. That's what happened. Now, Eli Whitney was only... 27 years old when he invented this cotton gin and he got a patent in 1794 but remember those factory machines textile machines like Samuel Slater remembered how to make it people would come to other farms and they'd say what is that machine you're using there it's called a cotton gin I can make one of those I can make one of those. So even though he patented it, people were making their own cotton gins. Sometimes bigger. Sometimes better. Now, several patents that he had were infringed on because people were making their own. Lawsuits he put against them. 
didn't matter because they said, well, that's not exactly like yours. We made ours a little different. No financial rewards for Mr. Whitney. He didn't make no money on it. Just a very little, but then nothing. Let me tell you the story. And I'll tell you how it goes. There was a man. His name was April. And April was a slave in South Carolina. His master's name was William Ellison. Mr. Ellison was getting old. And he wanted to let April go. Because he knew that he was about ready to die. And he didn't want April to be a slave no more. So he couldn't just write the paper. He had to go to a courthouse. And when he went to a courthouse, the judge says, well, what can this man do? He's a carpenter. He's a good carpenter. He can make things. All right. Judge says, you make me three pieces of furniture and you come back when you got them finished. Took him a couple months, came back. Judge went and looked at those pieces of furniture and he said, young man, did you make these? Yes, sir, I did. He said, well, I can see that you will never go hungry because you are a good carpenter. He was a master carpenter, folks. April was a master carpenter. They signed the papers right there. It was called manumission. Manumission. You understand that? Well, April didn't want to be called April no more, so he changed his name to William Ellison, just like his master had been. Now, what he started to do was make cotton gins. And he made them, and he made them. He became the most skillful person in the South to make cotton gins. He became a business. He became very wealthy. And because of that, he bought himself some land. And on that land, he started planting cotton and a couple other things. And he had over 100 slaves. Now, wait a second. Isn't, isn't April, who's now called William Ellison, was black? Yes, he was. He was black man. And he had black slaves. Well, I thought slavery is a color thing. It's a people thing, folks. It's a people thing. And William Ellison saw this money and he was making a lot of it became one of the wealthiest men in south carolina and he owned some slaves that kind of puts a bee in your bonnet don't it it changes some things around later on we're going to talk about him again but i just want you to know that there were people out there like him that could copy that cotton gin and make a lot of money on it and he sure enough did so in 1776, whoa, Zeke, you're going backwards. One last thing I want to tell you. There was an English economist. An economist studies the economy on things. Okay, 1776. His name was Adam Smith, and he wrote something called The Wealth of Nations. The Wealth of Nations. It argues that business runs best when left alone by government. Let me say that again. Business is best off when it's left alone by government. You know what they call that? Capitalism. It's called capitalism. Not socialism. No, socialism is run by government products. But capitalism lets you make as much money as you want to. Like William Ellison did. Like Eli Whitney did. Like Robert Fulton did. People, you all can make as much money as you want to because we live in a country that is free. The government doesn't have to control you. It doesn't have to control you. And it doesn't. Not here. Not yet. So the wealth of nations, you look it up. His idea was called capitalism. And it worked. It worked. I'm not saying government's not always involved in some part of your life. Even if you're in business, they will be. It's called taxes, okay? But you have control of your own company. Who knows how far you could go? Someday, maybe you'll help old Zeke out. I'm going to need things as I'm getting old. All right. I am pleased to tell you that we are done with this whole part on the 
American Industrial Revolution. There's a whole lot more I can tell you, but I just don't have the time today. So, remember, be kind to somebody. Tell somebody that you love, that you love them. And we'll get through all this that we're going through today together, won't we? We'll see y'all soon. Bye.